You are listening to episode 207 of the Game Deflators podcast. My name is John, and I'm joined by Ryan. Hey, everybody here at the Game Deflators podcast. We like to talk about games. We've recently picked up games we're currently playing, and we go on a nice, quiet trip to a little town in the mountains in this week's Inflation Deflation Challenge. So I'm guessing a nice little town and a quiet trip is in reference to Silent Hill. Exactly, exactly. We are excited for Spooky Month, and we are excited for the recent announcement of all the new Silent Hill stuff. So yeah, awesome. Pumped. Yeah, so the one disappointment I had uh, with Silent Hill, and we talked a little bit about F last week, was specifically the fact that there was no Silent Hill 1 remake. So I'm like, we got to play Silent Hill 1. Like, absolutely. So we did. Yeah. And I don't know how far you got. We'll Not get into that. Not that far. Not that far. I got decently far for what I was playing. It was more exploratory for me. Like, I actually we will dive in deeper, but I yeah. found some areas that I had, like, never actually explored in the times I played this game in the past, in mm. the beginning. And uh, I kind of got to close to the same spot as I always end for some reason. Like, I've over the years have picked this game up. I've played it for a bit. I get to a certain point. I get scared and then I stop playing. But now mm-hmm. that I'm older, it wasn't as bad. So I'm like, I think I could handle this. Um, oh, I so, played it at like 6 a.m. this morning. Dark. I played at seven with a baby near me. So that that was a little easier. Uh, all right. Well, before we get started, you can find this podcast on the podcast app you're listening to now. Uh, so Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, Google Podcasts, etc. You could find us on our out-of-date website, thegamedeflators.com. And, of course, you can find us on social media, at Game Deflators on Twitter, at The Game Deflators on Instagram and Facebook. And if you haven't done it left yet, not left, if you haven't done it yet, follow us, leave us a five-star review, comments on our social media, because we actually look at that pretty frequently and pull topics from that like we're going to do today. So we'll be talking about um, nine to five lobbies in video games for those of us that are not hardcore. Uh, we're going to talk UUCon today, Xbox Game Pass. Uh, so buying versus like that versus buying games and then the best jump scares in gaming. So have a little conversation there. But Ryan, pickups, I'm trying to think. Uh, I got the Ratchet and Clank game finally it came in the mail. Uh, I think it was Tools of Destruction. I can't remember. Pick that up. I also got uh, Cubix, like Robots for Everyone or something yesterday. Oh, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. that show. So there was a Cubix game at my Goodwill. I'm like, why not? Was like, it for Wii? No. Sounds like was, a Wii game. No, it was on PS2, actually. But it might as well have been for Wii. It's the same graphics, essentially. Um, so, yeah, I, I picked up Cubix for some strange-ass reason. And uh, that was all they had at my Goodwill that was worth picking up. Uh, they had like RoboTrek, Robotech, I forget the name of it, on PS2, but I've already got it on GameCube. Mm. And I find that to be the superior version anyways, the GameCube version. So there was no sense in getting that game. They had a copy of Rocky on the PlayStation 2, but why am I going to buy a copy of Rocky? Like, I guess, because cool, I don't have it if I was ever wanting to fill out the PlayStation 2 library. But no, no point, right? Like, it's not like the last time I'll ever come across a sports-based game. Are like you big that. on Rocky? I like the Rocky series, actually. Not, I really do. Not enough to to want the game as memorabilia, <laughs> right? No, it was like three dollars. It'll, you know what? I bet if I go in there, it was clean by like super crisp, uh, whereas Cubix was not. Cause clearly, a kid was playing it. But I'm sure if I went in like tomorrow to my Goodwill, Rocky would still be sitting there. Like nobody's running around like, oh look, it's Rocky on the PS2. Let me uh, pick. I mean, oh look, it's Rocky on the PS2. Let me pick it up. So, oh, Adrian. oh yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I did not touch that. Uh, as far as currently playing, um, I really wanted to play Terra Enigma this week, and I just didn't because I was reading D and D materials <laughs> because that's what I have to do until January when we Man, play. Did, was it complete the Rocky? Yeah, it's only like a ten dollar game. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's three dollars to pick it up or like 
not worry about it. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm just not. I looked up the price. Don't worry. Like, I looked up like if it was like a seventy something dollar game or like a fifteen dollar game, something like that. Then yeah, sure, I'd pick it up. But I'm not gonna pick up Rocky just to pick up Rocky and like put another game on my shelf. Then I'm like, eh. Cubex is cool because like it, even though it's scratched, and I'll probably you know have to go get it buffed out. Like my kid can play it down the road if he really wants to. Nobody and it's wants just, to. Nobody wants to, but it's it wasn't know, a good show. <laughs> if you look at two games on a shelf, Cubix or Rocky, dude, Rocky's like, got like a, a seven to nine. OK, I will go pick it up today if it's still available. All right. And then we'll play Rocky and then you can determine if it's inflated or deflated. <laughs> How does that sound? Yeah, I'm, I'm just saying, man, IGN gave it an eight point three. Game Zone gave it a nine point one. People like the Rocky. All right. Oh, well, if it's they're, still they're there, they're there for the Italian stallion. Man. If it's if it's still there, I'll pick it up. Um, so yeah, I wanted to play Terra Enigma. I didn't. Uh, my wife and I played a little bit of Crash Bandicoot. We got past the uh, bridge level. Um, that was a nightmare. Uh, but we got past that. And what else did I play? We played some Beat Saber this week. Uh, but the big thing was we've been watching like Smut TV on Netflix. You know, like. The Love is Blind shows and all oh, that yeah, crap. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I know we your wife to. watches it too. Yeah. So <laughs> we were watching that show, The Ultimatum. Oh, that's it, the worst show, isn't oh, it? Like, dude, that was so bad. Yeah. Like, oh, if, if you... True horror. If you um are listening and are looking for some, like, really cringeworthy TV, like, Love is Blind and ultimatum or like the cringiest of the cringe well you got to remember from the outset these people were chosen and volunteered for this show because they can't like meet people in real life well that's and, the love is and blind have premise. successful relationships yeah like that's the love is blind premise and they're like oh well is love truly blind i'm like you literally just put like 30 women and 30 men who have failed in relationships and failed to like keep things afloat. And you're like, let's just see if we put all these negatives together and maybe a couple positives come out. Right. And like, it, it always ends up with like two couples get married. And then like a year later, they divorce. I think there's like some... one couple that's still married. My wife said, yeah, no, I, I keep up with it. It's, it's interesting, but the ultimatum thing, like that's just like cheap pass heaven. Like that's all it was on that show. Like, yeah. Oh, that we're going to, a weird ass show yeah it's like i'm pretty sure everyone cheated under significant other but like no we technically broke up for three weeks i'm like really that's what the experiment was yeah i was doing it for you nick lachey <laughs> and what's your face i can't remember ruining couples one at a time <laughs> yeah it's a vanessa i think vanessa lachey oh so. okay. yeah so that's um that's what it oh uh one more pickup i picked up uh artwork at UbuCon. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I got um, the Deathly Bowels. Yeah, Voldemort and the Deathly Bowels. It's uh, literally Voldemort sitting on a toilet. It's um, by a bucket? By bucket, yeah. I was in between that and that canvas, but I was like, man, do I really want to drop $150 on a canvas right now? Yeah. So I bought the art print. It was like 40 bucks. It's pretty badass. We're going to get a good frame for it. Coincidentally, Michael's has frames on sale right now. Dope. So we're going to get a nice like 16 by 20 frame, put it up in our bathroom so we can look at Voldemort poop while we poop. It'll be nice. Great. Yeah. Um, that's it for me. As far as I know. So I got Nada on the pickups this week. I picked up a new Gundam model when we were at UbuCon. I got like this really old devil Gundam model. And man, when the guy said that there was like some color mismatching i was like eh, whatever so like last night i painted the feet uh a little bit and then <laughs> at some point i realized oh my gosh like the whole huge back of the head piece is like white and it's supposed to be like this weird blue black gray and i'm gonna be like oh my god how am i gonna color match that like it's easy to just like do red that's going to be on the toes and far enough away from everything else. Like nobody's going to know it's a different color red, really. Like yeah. it might stand up, but who cares? It's the toes anyways. But like the whole back piece, like you're not really going to see it, but it's like a huge amount of paint to have to put onto something like this. So it's going to be like my first real challenge, man. I really need to figure out like getting into airbrushing or something because I know that's the way to go for this stuff. But like, it's so hard. 
getting a motor and having a space and then I got to do it like outside. It's like, do you have do to do it that? outside? I thought you just had to have like a nice little like screened off area. I where like in this room, I don't I'm know, gonna, like, like you... build a spray booth. Yeah. Build a small spray booth. Like it doesn't have to be anything like crazy special. Well, It would have to have like ventilation. It would up. Like what I mean by a crazy spray booth is like, three walls that are tall enough that excess spray in a bottom and an excess spray doesn't go everywhere right and damage anything and it's deep enough to where any of the like um what do you call it the particles air particles or whatever are going upwards like that's the only thing i can think of like i mean people have to do stuff indoors like nobody is painting a their little like minifigs and models outside oh yeah but they might have a garage I don't think people are like spending time outside doing that. I think there's you just have I think to have you just do it at like a desk in a room. Yeah, dude. Like, soldering. I mean, I guess it's not like you're doing a ton of painting. It's no a small painting. I'll have to look into it. I, I've not really yeah. done the research, but I mean, hey, a whole new skill set to learn. Yeah, I mean, that's how like soldering and stuff. I do it on my desk and I just have like, well, yeah, but space soldering, that, you're not like you have fumes, though. There's yeah. fumes and soldering. So well, you can open a window, I guess. Like, I mean, I definitely burned a bunch of plastic in here with the soldering iron. Yeah. <laughs> nice. With the windows open and the fan blasting. Yeah, no, I just, I just do whatever the solder material is. Um, the non lead material, thankfully, unless I get it from China, which I'm kind of curious if there is lead still in it. I don't know. <laughs> um, by the way, who, uh, who bought that Gundam for you? And that, that also that Cubone, was it daddy John? That guy? Yeah. My that sugar guy? daddy, my sugar daddy. <laughs> I uh, I owed Ryan. Oh, that's right. I got that deck. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Ryan picked up one of the Magic: The Gathering Commander decks for Warhammer, which is like a limited print run, and uh, I owed him sixty bucks. So Daddy John stepped in and bought Ryan all the goods at this con. I've never gotten sixty bucks for handling a deck before. <laughs> yeah, we uh, we said different things at the con. So so good stuff. Uh, that's all I picked up this week. Uh, I tried playing Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon on 3DS, played it for like a half hour and then was like, I'm not really that into this and set it down and couldn't save. So I left it running, came back, finished like the first like little thing, started the second mission, set it down and it's still running. I, I don't know if I'm actually going to play it. I was like, maybe I'll play this for like to get in the Halloween spirit, but I don't know. It's. It's not that it's a bad game or anything. I just, I don't know. Something about me just isn't pushing to play it right now. Kind of like something about me isn't pushing to keep playing God of War, even though I got like 15 hours into it again. Jeez. That's like yeah. a 40, 50 hour game though. Isn't it? Yeah, I know. So like, yeah. I, I don't know. I just, I haven't really been in the mood for doing much gaming lately. I've just been doing my art and stuff instead and making little things. So that's where my time's mostly been going. Well, at least you have a choice. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I finished, I finished my inflation deflation very early this year. Actually, it's kind of time to start thinking about next year's. Yeah, I know. I, I don't know yet. I still think Shenmue 2 might be my option, but we'll find out. By the way, before you jump into your, your other piece here, so then you haven't messed with any Street Fighter. You haven't messed nope. with uh, Beyond Two Souls. I think you still have for me. None of that. Nope. Yeah, I haven't even played like any of the like last weeks and weeks of Playdate games. I'm going to start charging you interest. You're not going to play it. I don't have to, Ryan. It's Blockbuster. Do you think Blockbuster played their games when they rented them out? No, no. This is, we've talked about this. The people know this is the benefit of being on a podcast with somebody. You this just get friend. their stuff. So you're, what you're saying is that I'm your friend with benefits. <laughs> I mean, you're not hounding me about the lolth I still have. Oh, yeah, you do have my lolth still. <laughs> we have a list. <laughs> we'll yeah, maintain I know. A list. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll do tradesy backsies soon. Yeah, at some point we'll do tradesy backsies. Uh, all right. What was uh? So it looks like you oh, had a horror Brothers movie. War pre-release is coming out. So Dude, we need to go to that. That set looks good. I think that's going to be Friday the eleventh. Yeah, I'll go to that. I I can I think I can finagle my way into going to that. It might be one of those things that like 
Are we going to have to go to Baxter's? No. Okay. No, we're going to go to uh, Athoria. I'm just not like... They a had huge... a good turnout for the last pre-release we did there. Well, I, you know, like, I like Baxter's. Like, Baxter's is cool and all, but... Athoria... There's too many people and their benches suck. The benches suck. There's a few people that are cool, but a lot of them can be dicks. Whereas, like, Athoria is just a good, like... It's a chill vibe. Yeah, it's a super chill vibe. I mean, it's a little further out for me. It's a good, like, 15 miles extra to drive that way. But I'd, I'd kind of rather, for, from an experience standpoint, go there. Well, and it's in the middle for the three of us. Well, and their, yeah, and their prize support is much better, too. Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, I'm always down with that. I got uh, one recommendation uh, since this will be coming out on Spooky Day, if you want a good ass horror movie, check out Barbarian on HBO Max right now. is really good. It's got like a bunch of different turns in it, and it's just really not what you're expecting it's going to be a lot of the time. And it it definitely has some tension in there. But all in all, like. You could kind of cringe away at like the bloody parts and be fine. It's it's not the worst horror movie I've ever seen. By does the uh, long barbarian story. does the barbarian use rage? Oh yes. And a wolf totem? Mm, no wolf totem. No wolf totem? Okay, so it's uh, just a straight barbarian. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so it's uh it, it's definitely one that I would check out. And I guess for a secondary recommendation, we checked out this one that was okay called uh the rental. That was, um, I don't know, another one that was kind of like keeps you thinking it's going to be one thing and then kind of makes a total left turn where you're like, OK, well, I I thought this was going to be one movie and then it's kind of a different movie. Um, but that one's pretty good, too. And like the tension's good in that one and not a lot of like, ah, or super bloody or anything like that. Um, those are both pretty good horror movies to check out nice one's new one's a little older the uh uh rentals by dave franco he directed it interesting and it's got um is he related to the other francos yeah dave oh. franco is uh james franco's brother i thought he had a different i thought there were three then no you're thinking the hemsworths no I could have sworn like if James Franco and he has a little brother, right? Yeah, that's Dave. Oh, it is. I mean, shows he's like really I... tan. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. OK. Shows uh, you how much I really pay attention to celebrity life. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I'm I, I don't know names of celebrities very well at all. And yeah. then the uh, other one, Barbarian, is by one of the guys from The Whitest Kids You Know, which is a great old comedy sketch group. Yeah, so. that's cool. Yeah, both from people that I didn't really expect to be putting those out, but I liked them. Nice. Um, so let's start diving into our discussions here. So we're going to start with the uh, gaming of pro versus casual, because I felt that this was pretty interesting. Um, I posted a meme on our Facebook, as you probably who are listening or follow us on social already know, I like to post a lot of memes on gaming. And this meme in particular had a cat was sniper rifle and it said uh the pro player or like competitive player that plays eight to twelve hours a day and then the next you know paying down was me like a little cat within the scope site at the end uh saying me who is just getting off work and trying to enjoy some games for fun basically right and totally hits home on that and uh i laughed because i was like yeah we really need some like nine to five lobbies out here you know, Ryan and I are working good, like eight hours a day, kind of sit back, relax when everything's just kind of broken down after dinner. We're like, let's play a little bit of Apex or, you know, Call of Duty or something like that. And just getting demolished by people that are like, you know, eight to 12 hours a day. And so it sparked a good conversation, which is now like 70 comments deep. But I think it's because the guy just on there is just, you know, trying to continue making his point, which I have to say is wrong. Um, but his argument was that casual gamers are better than competitive players that put in eight to 12 hours a day 
because yes, you're only putting in three hours per day, but you're learning more about the game. Apparently you're putting in more effort into the game and trying to understand the mechanics and everything that goes into it more of a competitive player who's, or even just a general player who's playing eight to 12 hours a day. I was just like, that's completely wrong. You yeah. Know, like if you put two people side by side and one is eight to 12 hours a day and you put them on the same like level, right. To start eight to 12 hours a day and somebody that's playing three hours a day, you're right to an extent like that three hours a day person may have friends. They play with casually who are actually competitive or very good players and can kind of help them and teach them <clears throat> about the game and think about it in ways that they normally wouldn't think about. Or you have your eight to 12 player who maybe is learning on their own. Maybe they're just teaming up with randos, but they're actively learning. They're actively getting the feel of a the game. They're getting in more matches. They're getting a larger, you know, bit of experience that's tied to that, you know, that time put into the game versus, Hey, I'm going to play Wednesday night for three hours and I might not play again for like three hours on Saturday. And then the guy that's on there decided to make other comparisons. And he said, well, Fortnite is huge with casual players. Like the vast majority of people that play Fortnite are casual. And he cited a bunch of graphs, which had no source first off and no complete data and didn't say how many people said it. It was all self-reported data. And I'm like, so as a statistics guy, your graph sucks. Like it just doesn't make any sense, but you know, I'll play with this for a bit. And so I looked at it. I'm like, I get that, that there's a lot of casual players in Fortnite, but there's also a lot of competitive players in Fortnite and in lots of other games out there that are like that style. And Battle Royale is probably the worst comparison to make from like, like Fortnite specifically, because it's, it's one person, right? So like you could go the entire game as a casual, not really doing anything and third party kill for a win. Like doesn't mean you're good. It just means that there's some luck involved in the process. Yeah, you get a, a lot better odds in that scenario. Like any other game, it's about like g game knowledge is like the primary thing that you need. Like for any kind of like shooter or anything, it's like map awareness and like just being experienced with like hitting your targets and stuff. Like it wasn't until I started trying to play Apex a little bit better when I was playing back with you where it was the first time I ever went into like a shooting range in a game and like actually tried to do like some shooting drills that like I saw on YouTube or whatever, because it was like, okay, that makes sense. Like, you know, you would practice like this in real life. You should practice like this in a game if you want to get better, but that's still playing the game and ultimately coming down to like map awareness is like huge knowing where people could or would be or where they're going or where things are going to be located at. That's all super important. Like the only thing that I could think of that would be like maybe helpful to spend time away from the game and time in the game is like, like in fighting games, you need to learn like frame data and stuff. And that involves like a lot of looking things up and doing research on like, you know, what's going to be your best thing in a situation but ultimately it comes down to just knowing what button to push when. And the only time you knew, can know that is when you fight against other people and learn when their moves come out and when they're likely to use those. And that's all in game time. Like yeah. there's no, there's hardly any games that I can think of really that like the time outside of the game is as useful as the time inside the game. And that's the only angle that I could think of to try to come at how playing the game less than playing the game more could be more beneficial. Like from a day to day basis, I've heard that like with getting better at fighting games, like you can go into the dojo and like drill just doing a whole bunch of inputs and trying to get like better at your combos and stuff. And you can go online and like, immediately after and not be able to hit them and everything but like if you take a night to sleep on it like your brain downloads all that data at night and comes back as better muscle memory the next day like it's too fresh when you're just learning something to do it right away like 
even in school, it's very rare that you like learn a concept one day, master the concept that day and never come back to it. Like you need time to ingest and ingrain those things into you. So like maybe playing for like three hours a day, doing like directed learning during that time and training specific things and then taking time away from the game to reflect and that's not what this guy's argument is though this guy's argument is that people who get off work and play from like five to eight are better than people who don't go to work and play from nine to five i don't know about that one (laughs) yeah and like one of the other arguments they brought up was and this was probably the poorest example and by the way like my whole thing was like dude practice makes perfect like ah you know what In today's modern gaming, people who have nine to five jobs can afford better in game <laughs> stuff <laughs> and buy their way to victory. That's what it is. It's exactly the paywalls and everything that are up for us. Uh, That's certain what weapons. it is. Yeah. So we're cheating to win. <laughs> we have more money so we can do it, uh, which is also doubtful because some of those guys who play eight to 12 hours a day probably make more than I do. Um, so, yeah, one of my arguments is, of course, practice makes perfect. And then 99% of the time, a casual is going to get wiped out by somebody like competitive player. Somebody plays eight to 12 hours a day. And the other thing he brought up, though, was like Pokemon. And he's and this was a decent argument for Pokemon. Right. But it's a poor comparison. So he said, well, the more you play Pokemon over a period of time, the more you understand the game and the better you get at playing Pokemon. And I said, that's fine. But Pokemon doesn't require the necessary re- reflexes like that of a, a gun game, like, you know, first person shooter or, um, you know, fighting game or driving simulator, flying simulator, all those things. Like I can tell you right now, playing, you know, RPGs almost my entire life that I am so much better at RPGs today than I was 20 years ago. And the reason being is because I've played so many RPGs and so much that has transferred and I understand the concepts. I understand the level grinding that's necessary and certain abilities and elements and things that are tied to it. But I'm still putting in like on a week to week basis, I could put in probably about eight to 12 hours a week from a casual standpoint and learn that over time. But it's taken years to get to like certain understandings of RPGs. Pokemon's another way, right? Like, oh, I need to you know, kill X or not kill, but like faint X amount of Pokemon in the game with this Pokemon help boost one specific stat while I'm trying to build the following. Like there's so many different mechanics and things tied to Pokemon that, yeah, I get it. Like you're going to play like three hours in a day and then you're going to spend time researching and understanding and trying to develop your skills in Pokemon. And that's totally cool. You know, versus somebody that's putting in eight to 12 hours a day playing Pokemon, right? Like one of them's rushing through the game, playing as much as they can. The other one's like getting a clear understanding of game. That makes sense. But Pokemon's not a competitive game. Yeah. Like, you know, like two totally different types of areas. So I think it's and you can even put into the workplace, right? Where you were at in your job, you know, last year when I guess when you first came on board to where you are today, you've put in hours on a day-to-day basis you're actively learning you're actively educating yourself throughout and learning on the job to to get a better understanding of what you have to do same with me i've been in my role for going on seven years with my company what i have learned you know a year ago when i first started i knew nothing what i know today is a ridiculous amount of knowledge compared to where i was even last year i've learned a whole bunch and just every year you build up on that and so i could see certain games yes casual time learning edge self-educating talking with other people you could totally get to that point competitive atmosphere not so much you can but it'll take you a lot longer than somebody that's putting in eight to 12 hours a day yeah so yeah cool um well let's talk some ubukan Ubukan. so ubukan it's still technically going on today as we record uh ryan and i generally will uh, go to these conventions. We'll check it out for a day, take some photos, um, talk to people, get a good feel for what's going on, and then we'll head off and then we'll do a recording. And so we'll generally do like Saturday because it's a peak day. Yeah. And so Uukon was out of Mesa at the Bell Bank Park this year. I think it was technically. I keep re- wanting to say 
like Bell Bank ballpark, but it's not a ballpark. Well, it's an all ballpark. It's like it's, this big yeah. sports complex with every kind of sport you could imagine. Yeah. So to kind of preface this convention or this organization that's hosting this held like some car type show or anime car show in like Mesa like a year or two ago. And the event got shut down because there was like too many people. Right. So they figured, oh, cool, we'll do like this anime con. Um, and so I would consider it as kind of their first year. You know, I, I wouldn't consider that prior show to be their first year. Right. No. Yeah. So I see this as their first year. And, you know, I'll give my honest opinion as somebody that, you know, again, hosted a con for a number of years. You know, I don't know what their attendance was, um, but I know what their ticket cost was. And I know the layout and I know what they brought in and I know the process in which it takes to put all of that together. And it was paid parking. And it was well, parking was actually included with tickets, but obviously oh, I got was? but that got rolled into the ticket price, I'm sure. Like nobody sits there and says, Hey, so we can have our ticket for thirty dollars or we can make it forty five and say say it's free parking. You know, like so that's kind of what I saw with that. Um and I'm I don't know the process because we obviously, you know, to preface again, we came in as media, so you know, there's free tickets and we went in like vendor space for parking and all that. So it's a little different. Um, but I think they were doing like a hundred dollars on a weekend. Uh, VIP was like 200. They had uh, like $38 or something for like Friday pass. I think Saturday was like 50 or so. And then Sunday was probably a little lower. I didn't look at the exact price, but I know hundred was a weekend price. And we technically went in with like what would be a weekend pass. And, you know, it, it's not to, um, knock on the convention because I felt that overall the quality of voice actors they brought in was great. Um, and who they brought in was great. The vendor hall was phenomenal. It was a lot of vendors, a lot of artists. Well, it was, it was a big vendor hall. It was a lot of vendors, but the thing was, it was, it's pretty much all artists. There were very few like actual official merch places. Like mm-hmm. I'm a gunpla guy. I scoured that place. We walked through that whole hall like three times. There were like two places selling Gundams and one place that had like all of them, two of them. Oh, OK. So like there were three places in there that had any at all and only two places that had more than a couple. And I yeah. was just like. That's like super sad. There was like maybe two or three tables that were selling like, you know, just like sprawling tables full of like other figures and stuff. There was like, I I don't think we saw any game representation at all. No, there was like some card game representation was predominantly like Pokemon. There was Pokemon and like Vice Wars and stuff. Yeah, I don't think I saw any magic. And, you know, so... I, I liked it for the variety of artists predominantly and a lot of local artists, which is cool yeah. and smaller artists. And so that was pretty interesting. The thing that I think is going to hurt this event is like, like I said, I don't know their attendance numbers, but it seemed kind of sparse. Yeah, it was pretty and, empty when we and, got there. And until we left, it didn't seem like it filled out that much. And we got there at nine and we left like right around noon. Well, and I mean, and people start coming to coming in at noon. Um, but I, I have other, you know, folks I know that said it was still kind of light um, later on. So it's for a first year con. Here's kind of my not necessarily criticism, but feedback. If you're going to host an event in your first year, a couple things need to happen. One of them is the vendor hall location to that of the voice actors was way too far. And the panels, there weren't a whole lot of panels going on. So like when we got there to go check out a panel at 11, there was nobody else waiting, by the way, for panels, Um, maybe two people. But the room where panels were hosted were very small and they weren't set up because there were little girls dancing there because they had preset activities prior to the con. Everywhere at this con was families walking around with kids in jerseys for every kind of sport. Like at one point we cut through a gym that was like five basketball games, like four volleyball games. And like there was like pickleball rooms and like literally every sport you could imagine was at this place. Like when I first got there, 
I followed a big giant sign that said Ubukan with an arrow pointing to the left. And I drove down a dirt road that was obviously the wrong direction to go in. And like, I'm like, okay, what is going on here? And apparently next to that dirt road was a big lot for the event parking for Ubukan. It was all the way on the other side. That's where the free event parking was. All the other spots in the parking lot were paid parking. Yeah. And then I had to drive all the way to the other side of the building to get to the vendor parking. So it was like very confusing going in like, and just kind of a nightmare. Like I've never been to a con where there's another con happening at the same time, but maybe it happens. Uh, but in this situation, it's just like every parent in the tri-state area with a kid in a sport was there also well and i think that might be what they were banking on for the show when they hosted that venue was hey there's a ton of families we can advertise here at the facility maybe they'll uh, all just come do stuff after they get yeah, done yeah or they're done with games but like at the same time these parents are there at like 8 a.m till like 11 right like these parents probably don't want to like go to the anime con right after, right? They're like, no, let's go home. Like we're good. Or we don't want to spend whatever amount of money for the day. Like, so, you know, venue like, only so, winners get to go to Ubu con. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. So I think venue wise, I'm not a big fan of selection and I'm not a big fan of the setup. So uh, like I said, the panel room, there are people doing things there. I think what they should have done is take that vendor hall, make it half of the size. It was not maybe do the whole vendor hall, maybe uh, as it was, but put all of your voice actors in that same hall. So you save on the space and the distance needed to go travel that to that spot. Voice actor hall was way huge. It, well, I think they were like, it was outrageous. People. How many, how big that area was like, they were expecting like hundreds of people to stand in line. And I think they could have got that if they would have like that back wall in the vendor hall, there was nothing on that back wall to the South side of that, of that building. You could have lined all your voice actors on that back wall yeah. and put like stanchions basically yeah. set up for people. And you would have had a trickle effect of like, oh, I'm going to do some shopping and I'm going to go see like this voice actor, go talk to them and get my autograph. Like all of it would that have been cheaper. Space. Well, and the other thing is that by having your voice actors in the same hall as your exhibitors is it keeps everything condensed. And then if you have a voice actor who, for example, um, like the voice of Luffy was there or original voice of Luffy. And if there's one piece stuff and people will have find one piece art, they can be like, Oh snap. I didn't realize the voice of Luffy was here. Let me go grab this piece of art from this vendor and have her go sign it. And now you've made the vendor happy. And now do you, you know, the customer's happy. Cause they're like, Oh cool. Like I knew Luffy was here. I just purchased a cool piece of art. I just got it signed by Luffy. And on top of that, your artist is happy or really not your artist, but your, your voice actor is happy because well, they're getting paid right on their guarantee or towards their guarantee. So I think there's something to be said about that. Um, that would be my one big issue at the event was that. And then the panel room felt like an afterthought to me. Like I, I was really hoping to go into a panel and we tried, like we went up and we're like, Hey, is, when does the panel start? Oh, well, it we might went be over there three times. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, it might be canceled. So we're like, okay, well, we'll come back. And then, oh, well, it starts at 11. And we're like, okay, cool. So we we go back at 11. We're like, oh, yeah, no, there's still little girls dancing in here. You're going to have to come back at like 12 for the next panel. I'm like, well, if the next panel's at 12 and this panel hasn't happened, like, I'm not going to continue coming back and seeing like, and when we came back like the third time, there were like three people waiting. I'm like, I I can't like sit back and take a picture of three people in a panel. Like, that's just... You know, I know I'm saying it on the podcast, but that's just not a good visual yeah. for a convention. So my overall, overall thought was good artists, some good vendors from my perspective. Um, great voice actors brought in a lot of great talent. Location wasn't the best and panels were not, you know, they were nothing because we didn't see them. We just couldn't. And I heard a rave was really good, too, the night before. But they were doing like a Saturday rave as well, which I found interesting. Um, so I would say if you're interested in going to this event in the future, I personally would not do a weekend pass. I would choose a day that you think is going to be best for you and your family to attend and you go one day 
And I think that's how you treat it. And I would go later in the day. Later in the day. Well, I mean, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for like great vendor and artist type stuff, you kind of want to go a little early just to make sure. But I mean, look at the schedule. See like what panels are happening, when voice actors are doing what, um, when those voice actors are going to be like signing autographs and such. Budget accordingly because this con, the, there were guarantees for all the voice actors to sign stuff, right? So if they're charging for autographs and you know, shout outs and that type of stuff. Um, so yeah, it's just something to consider. Uh, I, I would say one day for sure for this event. I, I personally would not justify a weekend as much as it sucks. And like we wouldn't be invited back, I'm sure by saying this, but I think it's good enough for a one day show. Saturday would be my preference um, just because it's a little easier. There's a lot more going on. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my whole deal with it. Cool. Yeah. I think uh, that uh, some things could have been a little bit different to have changed my opinion on it. Like if we had gone later in the day, there was more of a crowd. There was a panel to see. There wasn't as many families and stuff running around. Like maybe if I had, uh, you know, I don't know. They, there was just not it didn't really feel like a con it felt like i was at like i i don't know like a, a like a like a, a fair, fair in a gym yeah. or something like it just didn't really have like the con feel like there was not really like any there were people wearing stuff but there wasn't like a lot of like really cosplay going on or anything there wasn't a lot of like the standard fair that you would think that you would see um i did kind of go and see um an alleyway where they had a whole bunch of food vendors set up um you know maybe if i had tried the food and gotten something and like a beer later in the day but it was like 10 in the morning i didn't want a, a beer and asian food at the time so like you know, a few little different things might have been a better experience. Not the worst first year for a con by all means, but maybe we'll check it out next year and see if we've got better news to report. Yeah, I mean, I would love to go next year and check it out and see like the improvements. I mean, and this is, you know, again, like just general feedback on the event. So like if the organizers are listening, I mean, thank you for yeah, the invitation. Like, thanks for the invitation. We had a good time. We did. Um, we did have a good time. Um, you know, I'd love to go back next year for sure and see how things have changed and, and report back and be like, Hey, it was successful enough to do a second year. And, you know, some of it could just be like, Hey, we need to, I, I hate to say it, but we need to make a lot of money this first year to be able to justify doing a different venue in the following year. And here's how we're going to do it. But I, I'm not sure if, if you have like, voice actors not making money and vendors not making money because it's a sparse crowd based on location your second year while you may have made that money you're gonna have received some negative feedback in the general industry and market that people may not want to return and so that could hurt the event in the long run but we'll see i mean we could be talking 10 years from now and they're like the biggest thing in uh in arizona yeah know? Um, so that's really what it, what it kind of came down to. I had a good time after the show. <laughs> so, um, I'm buddies with, uh, one of the voice actors that I've known for about 10 years that was at the show. And so we went out, well, the idea was, Hey, let's go get some dinner. And that ultimately didn't happen, but he's like, Hey, why don't you come to a hotel and uh, we'll grab a drink. I said, okay, you know, that sounds good to me. And I pop up and well, there's like nine voice actors chilling at the table and they're like, Oh, Hey, we'll make some room. So like, I spent three and a half hours last night with like nine voice actors just kind of chilling after the show and, and just, you know, learning from them and hearing their feedback on different shows and such. And, um, you know, just not the show in general, just shows as a whole constantly yeah. attend. And in like, you know, you hear like the behind the voice actor stories too. So a lot of fun stories that were tied to that. I'm not going to get into details on that type of stuff, but, um, yeah, it was a good time afterwards. Did a little networking for us, which is pretty cool. So we might have somebody on in the future. Um, so exchange information with that person and uh, hopefully have have that individual on. And, uh, you know, I would say for me, like personally, that was my highlight because getting to see one of my old friends and then, you know, 
Making new friends. Making new friends, which, I mean, dude, we, me and one person had a conversation about video games for like an hour and a half. Like, we just were chilling, talking games. And my baby was there, so they were like, oh, look at the baby. And like, I'm like, dude, like this kid will, down the road, he'll be watching like all these different cartoons and be like, you met that person and that person (laughs) and that person. Right. (laughs) So, um, but it's super down to earth conversations. It's always a good time. They invite us, uh, my wife and I, to go to an escape room. Uh, a few different actors, but we um, we were not available to do that because we had a child. Mm-hmm. And uh, but that would have been escape cool. with a baby. Oh man, no, like it was several, yeah, several of them. We some of us talked about uh, the whole like you know what we talked with Chuck, um, the Mario situation, and you know Chris Pratt, and you know of course we we're all like all of us agreed. We we're like you could put anybody as Mario. And it would still go gangbusters on sales. Yeah. Like it, it's Mario. It's the property. Like people are going to see Mario, not to see Chris Pratt. Now, Jack Black's a different story. Like he's straight up. Jack Black be sells. Great. Yeah. He's going to be great in that role for Bowser. And Bowser doesn't really have a ton of lines. But like Martin A, uh, he's had full blown presentations that Nintendo has hired him to do where he talks as Mario in his Mario voice and has toned it down accordingly. So, you know, it, it's always cool to hear directly from industry sources like their overall thoughts on something Mm -hmm. like this and all of them they all agree um you know it it really they really should be kind of considering folks like martin a and um it's i you know i said this i'm like it's almost insulting in fact it is insulting that you've got this guy who's like a trained voice actor and the vast majority of people that are out there on the internet think Oh, he's just going to be saying like, it's a me and doing all of his crazy high pitched voices when that's not the case. He's a classically trained voice actor. And it's it's just super insulting for a guy that's been in the industry as long as he has to just be shit all over by fans who just don't know any Mm -hmm. better. And it, it just bugs me. So industry, man, industry. Yeah. All right. Uh, wow, we are going long on this episode. Yeah. Uh, so, all right. This next topic will be pretty quick. This is uh, Xbox, Xbox, yeah, Xbox Game Pass uh, versus buying the game. What's cheaper? We do the math. It's Zachary McAuley at CNET. Um, McAuley. McAuley? I don't know. It looks like it says McAuley. Um, so he basically did the math. I'm not going to go into the math here. Um, the general idea here is what's the better value here and i'll it, do the math john we're okay. a math podcast we're not a ma- okay we well we're lie. a numbers podcast so anyways brass tax this is what it's going to run you across the board so we're talking about what's the best investment for your money and i was so right about this this is exactly what i did and i started last year so console price uh an xbox series s 300 dollars. an xbox series x Five hundred dollars. One year of Game Pass is one hundred and twenty dollars. Uh, one year of Game Pass Unlimited is one hundred and eighty dollars. The difference is that you can do the cloud gaming. I, I didn't realize that that's the difference. So apparently, I've been paying sixty extra dollars this year to not cloud game. But you know, maybe I will cloud game in the future. So maybe I'll save sixty dollars. Maybe I won't. That's my decision. So either way for the Xbox Series S, you're spending $420 to $480 if you're just doing Game Pass. On the other end, if you do an Xbox Series X with a game, you're going to be in $560 to $570 for one game and that Xbox Series X, and that's all you get. If you want to throw Game Pass on top of that, now you're talking 740 to 750. So significantly more. I mean, hundreds of dollars more to just get one game. Like I bought one game. I bought Elden Ring, and that's it. And other than that, I'm just living on this Game Pass until I can get a PS5 Slim at some point. But, you know, it just shows you that you can really save a ton of money in this gen if you go into it the right way. Like there's definitely been news and stuff lately and murmurs of a bunch of studios saying that they don't want the Xbox series S to be supported and it's holding back the next generation of games. Uh, I've been having a great time on mine. You know, if, if the promise of 60 FPS can't be fulfilled by the next gen consoles, I don't think that that's the 
Xbox Series S's fault. I think that plenty of developers have been able to make it work and plenty more will be able to do in the future. You know, whether it's the easiest thing or whether they feel like, you know, being forced to support the Xbox Series S is going to hold things back. You know, it may in the long run, but um, I don't know. I'll, they'll figure it out. They'll come out with some mid-gen thing. Like maybe they won't support this one as long as they supported the original like Xbox One VCR. You know, there's lots of things that they could do to make things better going forward. But like if you want to just talk bottom dollar, Xbox Series S, Game Pass, that's the best way to get into the current gen of consoles. Yeah. And at some point I'm probably going to find myself getting a series S I'll wait till it's used specifically. So I'm not paying, you know, crazy amount and I'll do game pass on that. Or um, if I can get a new GPU, which I plan on uh, this year, I'll go ahead and do it on there. And just or you could always PC. get that stream box if they, when they come out with that. Yeah. That's also an option depending on where I want to play. Um, but, you know, so the idea here is, you know, what's cheaper, right? It depends on how many games you're playing. So if you're playing a ton of games, then, and you don't necessarily use Game Pass, or let's just say you're playing a ton of games and you use Game Pass, um, and a Series S, yes, that's the way to go. But if you play like one game, like say your game is Madden, and it's all you flip and play is Madden, Right you're probably going to be okay not getting Game Pass because it's all you play every year is Madden. Yeah. And one year of Madden is 60, 70 bucks, unless you're doing microtransactions and other stuff. But you're still going to be paying for that, you know, if it is on Game Pass. And I don't think Madden is. I don't recall no. if it is or not. Yeah, no, so not. I mean, like, that's the situation. So it's really a case-by-case basis on what's going to be best. We know for sure, like, Ryan and I would be okay doing Game Pass and Series S because, well, we don't necessarily care about all the graphics. And it just doesn't make sense to to, you know, continue buying games on one console versus another. I would be doing this specifically for exclusives and an experience. That's it. So Series S Game Pass all the way. Um, but I can see where, you know, somebody might only play Call of Duty or they might only play, you know, well, one Call Assassin's- of Duty. You know, there that's the big topic right now is will Call of Duty be allowed to go to Game Pass if this deal passes? And, you know, as far as the sports things, like, I mean, MLB, the show or whatever, Mm -hmm. that's published by PlayStation, but on Game Pass. Well, that's because uh, MLB shut that down. They're like, if you want to keep the contract that we have with you to continue publishing this game, it has to be on the Xbox as well. And that's where it's really shitty, because, like, you have Microsoft going out and, like, purchasing all these, you know, different contracts or different organizations to try and, you know, bring games over to to Xbox and, you know, Bethesda recently. And then you've got, of course, uh, you know, the new acquisitions that are occurring on a day-to-day basis and, uh, or Activision Blizzard. And yeah, I mean, I I can see the argument Sony's making, like we're getting pushed from outside sources to put games like MLB to show on the place on the Xbox, like, and you're going to start taking away things like Call of Duty franchises sell quite a bit and it's actually kind of dumb for microsoft to do that and we've talked about it well like, they've talked would... about it plenty saying that you know yeah. it doesn't mean make... it'll stay on other platforms as long as it makes profitable sense yeah and like well they've said like oh well maybe after three years it'll be coming off of playstation that is quite possibly the dumbest thing that they could do like you're in-house you're developing it so it's all your finances internally you're going to be making money off of having the game on playstation like, yeah, you might not be selling your consoles, but you sell consoles at a loss. Your money and bread and butter is in the games themselves and what you make from that. And if you're developing it, it doesn't hurt you to have an Xbox game like on the Yeah, but they also don't want to be giving their competitor 30% cut of all microtransactions. Yeah, and I get that. But would you rather... Like you're gonna have a majority These... of PlayStation players say, you know what? I don't care. I'm just gonna find another first person shooter to play on PlayStation. Yeah, but they've already said themselves that they don't think that they're capable of developing a good enough competitor. Well, we'll see. Only I mean, time will tell. PlayStation's working on putting out like 10 live service games. Like 
if they're going to get everybody hooked on those, not enough people are going to have time for Call of Duty. Like, I feel like no matter how big Call of Duty is right now, everything has its day in the sun and, you know, then it goes away. Like, yeah. Call of Duty's been so on top for so long, it won't last forever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I'm, I'm there with you. All right, our next thing that we're going to look at is the 10 best jump scares in uh, gaming. And so this is by CBR, and it is uh, Peter Kunis who has uh, written this one up. I see your note here, Ryan. I'm just going to go through the list real quick. So Some... I may have uh, misinterpreted. I wasn't thinking just jump scares. I was thinking like scares in games in general. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily know that either of these have a really specific good jump scare scenario where they're presented. Yeah. Well, let me read off this list. And uh, some of you may have played these games. Some of you may not. So the first one is uh, Dark Souls Mimics. The jump scares that are tied to Dark Souls Mimics. I don't agree with this one, but there's a reason it's number 10, I guess is it's probably the least scary out of all of them. And, you know, like, I are mimics scary? Kind of. I mean, when you go I guess when you think you you're going to get a nice treasure in a game that's scary as hell because you're always getting just shreked by every enemy, and then all of a sudden the box wake up and just, like, tatsus you across the room, like... Yeah, I mean, I think the scary part on that is when you're running away from the mimic and you're like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. And you're just trying to get away from this mimic and get to a point where you can kill it. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily say it's a jump scare for me. It's more so the frantic aspect of like needing to run away so you can position yourself accordingly. Well, doesn't it just like, does it instantly kill you if you try to open it? No, it stands up and it chases you. Okay. And starts swiping at you. It's uh it's horrifying, but it's not jump scare worthy, I don't think. Uh Resident Evil 7, uh, with any scene where it is quiet. Yeah. And you're walking around. Now, I will say, by the way, I have just purchased Resident Evil 7 with the VR mode. Uh Ooh. for because I had the five dollar coupon from GameStop and it's you know ten dollars, so I'm getting it for five bucks. Uh so we'll see how that goes. Um yeah, that'd be but, really creepy. Yeah, I, I would agree that the quiet scenes in really any horror game are going to be scary. Uh, number eight on the list is Bioshock's Dentist. Do you remember playing that scene? Okay, so that's like the thing. Like, was that a jump scare? Oh, yeah, absolutely for me. Uh, you walk into this room and you just hear his voice and all of a sudden you're being like shot at and chased by this <laughs> flipping dentist. Like, and it's so early on in the game that it's unexpected. So you're just like, oh, la di da di da I'm going to have my shotgun and I'm going to walk around and, you know, these various areas. And then you walk in like the door closes and the lights go like red, if I recall. And then this guy's chasing you around. Dang. So it's been a while since I played Bioshock absolute jump scare for me that scared the hell it's the only scary scene in that game too i feel um condemned uh criminal origin spooks players of a locker so i'm guessing there is specifically uh so it says that there's a locker and then you investigate a corpse that is stuffed in the locker it tells the player to take a picture of the corpse's face needless to say this does not go well um so <laughs> i have not played that game uh but i have I seen played it a play. long time ago like at like a Halloween sleepover or friend's birthday sleepover or something. Yeah. I'd see my brother play it. And uh, I remember there being some scary scenes, uh, but I didn't really dive into it. I remember uh, there being a bunch of creepy mannequins mm -hmm. that were really freaky. And like you'd turn around and then they'd be like in different places or something. Yeah. Uh, the next one is evil dead turns jump scares into a tool. So uh, basically the Necronomicon is the big thing here. And it says, um, so Evil Dead, the game deserves praise for its brilliant use of jump scares as a game mechanic. The demon player can charge up in a rush attack while they're invisibly, or as they invisibly circle the survivors. If they land the rush attack, the survivor player or surviving player gets a jump scare in the form of a demon popping up on screen and raising the character's fear level and spooking the player at the same time. That's just ridiculous. I've never heard of that game. Yeah, I hadn't played it. 
Uh, the next one I have played, and that's Amnesia, The Dark Descent. And it says it has a late game shock. Uh, because it's late game, I'm not going to you know dive into exactly what it is. Um, and it says that apparently it waits a long time to provide a jump scare in a late game. And there's like a certain thing that you interact with that provides this jump scare. That game in general is scary as all hell. So, and you just get like goosebumps as you play it. Um, but to have a jump scare as well is a little ridiculous. Did you beat it? No, I didn't. Like I played with Justin and Justin pussed out on me. Mm. Like he was just like, I can't keep playing. It's too dark. I'm like, dude, like I was just laughing. I'm like, this game is like hilariously like scary, but it wasn't scary enough that I would not play it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know about this one. It's called Iron Lung. So it says Iron Lung terrifies of a single photo. So I know a little bit about this one. This one is like a really weird, like you're a submarine on another planet and you don't have like any visual data input for the game. That's like outside environment or anything. You're like inside the submarine and using the controls to like, adjust your like longitude and latitude and your depth to like explore this map. And you take pictures of the outside because you're in like a blood ocean. And like the last picture that you take is this like weird, creepy squid monster or giant eye or something. But um, yeah, I think uh Matt Pat covered it a few weeks ago or a month or two ago on uh game theory somewhere says it takes an, less than an hour to beat so that might be something for us to give a shot down the road um next one is dead space 2 apparently there's a giant smiling sun that pops out or you just kind of turn around a corner and see it and it's supposed to be super scary i can honestly see that as a jump scare you're kind of traversing through this like already scary game and you turn around and there's a giant ass smiling sun like just the color alone should get you um so yeah i totally see that one as uh Uh, high up on the list as this one is i wonder if they would consider putting something like this kind of a a fun scare into the one remake maybe they probably will uh next is prey turns a coffee break into a nightmare um so there's apparently a jump scare in this game that introduces the player to uh one of the main enemies which is a shape-shifting typhoon of aliens or typhoon Typhoon. aliens yeah yeah i me and Bree played and beat this a couple years ago so this is like right at the beginning of the game and it's how you like meet these uh normal enemies that can transform into basically any object in the game. So you're kind of always aware and wary of everything else in the game because anything could be like a mimic. Um, Ultimately it winds up not really being a very scary mechanic. I Mm -hmm. can see how if you were on like harder difficulty and they were like really lethal, it definitely giving more edge to them. So the last one, is uh, and number one on the list is Devotion, which apparently has a number of uh, jump scares. But it says specifically, the player solves a puzzle in one of the game's many surreal apartment settings by placing a small ballerina figure on a birthday cake. The figure twists and distorts in ghostly ways. Then, for the first time in a game, a human being besides the player appears on screen. It's quiet and innocuous, and it's incredibly spooky. So that kind of would scare the shit out of me. Like... You just play it and all of a sudden you look and there's this one random ass person who's never been in the game with you. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's that list. Um, So, you know, jumping from jump scares, man, I I had a good transition there and I didn't like jumping from jump scares to jump scares. Uh, Silent Hill for inflation deflation. Um, I'm going to kind of I'll talk about a jump scare in the game that I experienced years ago. Uh, here in my little bit, but uh, to kind of start out, developed by Team Silent. Oh, surprise, surprise. So funny. Uh, published by Konami. It was directed by Kiichiro Toyama, and it was released in February of 1999. I almost said 2099, which would have been like crazy. 2099. The year 2099. Silent Hill, still poor graphics and hasn't been remade. Uh, it is a survival horror, and reception is an 8 out of 10. So... As I said earlier in the episode. Oh, I no, pl- it's a it's actually an 8 to 10. What did I say? 8 out of 10? Oh, yeah, yeah. 8 to 10. Yeah, sorry, 8 to 10. 
Um, but it could be an eight out of 10, depending on who you read. Yeah. So I played this game, as I said earlier, a number of times over the years, I always get scared at a certain portion of the game and I stop playing. Um, so you've never you sh- finished it. No, I have not finished this one, even though I desperately, and I think a big portion of it is because the controls are still a little wonky for me. Yeah. There's times where you're like, Oh, I need to move forward. But you, like the camera angle has you at a point where you're thinking, oh, I need to push down, but it's really you got to push up with the analog stick. Mm-hmm. So that kind of jacks up your way of thinking with the game. Over time, it gets easier. Like I promise, if you haven't played this game, you get very used to it's controls. Big tank controls. What's that? It's tank controls. Yeah, you get super used to it. Like it's actually a pretty quick learning experience after a while. Um, and the good thing is like you have easy, normal and hard mode. I went easy mode because like I just don't want to die a bunch of times. And it's been so long since I played it. And I'll tell you, easy mode, I racked up like 180 bullets today in okay. that 30 minutes. So I did normal, did normal mode and I was like, OK, I got the I, so I played this game one time before I booted it up, I think, with my wife and we were going to check it out. And in that first like diner cafe, when like the gargoyle thing comes through the window and you're just not sure what to do, we died. And then we turned it off and we never played it again. So that was my previous experience. So this time, like I smoked the gargoyle after it killed me the first time because I was like, I better be careful with my ammo. I should see if I can kill this thing with the knife. Cannot kill this thing with the knife. No. (laughs) So it killed me. And then I smoked it and I just kept shooting things. And every time I would go in to reload, I would feel like it wasn't counting all the bullets that I was shooting. Like sometimes I'd shoot five guys and I'd go in and it'd say my capacity was at 13. Interesting. And I'd be like, I definitely shot five bullets, but it only said I shot two. So I I didn't get up to 180, but the highest I got to was like, uh, 60 something or 80 something i think they give you more bullets on the difficulty setting um i was like you know what i'm gonna play this easy because i just want to enjoy the game you know i don't want to go into like normal mode or hard mode for that purpose my first ever experience of silent hill was when i was much younger and i went into cafe and i died right because i didn't know what the hell to do uh years later i played it again and got the gun and all that stuff um traversed the town got to the school where I had the crazy jump scare, which I'm going to bring up now, which is you open up a locker and a flipping cat pops out. It's I couldn't get to the shit ever. Yeah. I mean, there's a so way to like, get there. I all didn't get there. The roads around. are closed. They are, but there's a specifically a building that has three locks that you have to get through. Okay. I found the door with the three locks in the back yeah. of the dog house. Yep. Okay. So, that's how I get there is through the back of the doghouse. I, if I recall, I didn't even think about that. So I like I found the note, went to the doghouse and then basically explored the whole map looking for a way to get around the roadblocks and didn't even think to go back to the doghouse until I was like, I should save and quit. Yeah. So now yeah, I just I, need to find three keys. Yeah. And that's kind of how I ended up, too. I don't I don't remember how to get past that part, but there's there's a lot to explore in that game. Um, yeah. So. I, of course, you know, on easy mode, just started going everywhere I could. And I was picking up bullets left and right and just had a shit ton of bullets. Um, Got to the doghouse as well. But I have been to the school and the school is usually where I get panicky and stop years ago. And I also got the lead pipe. So that was another cool thing I got. I got the lead pipe, too. Yeah, I got the lead pipe. I got the knife. I got the radio, of course, and the flashlight, all that good stuff. Multiple first aid kits that I picked up throughout the game. Mm -hmm. Um, Multiple bullets, everything like I was pretty loaded up to to go do this i Um, felt surprisingly loaded up like i thought this was going to be like really survival horror so i googled like what's the difficulty and everybody says that they're really not yeah like this one's definitely not the second one's definitely not the third one has a little bit more challenge in it four has some good challenge from a puzzle standpoint but it's also not very the games are not very challenging like i'll just room yeah the room that's my favorite out of all of them but um which I don't think is a favor for most. So with one, you know, like I said, years ago, I got into school and there's these little like black ghostly figures. And I think the big thing for me is the radio sound, the static. Yeah. And you've got like this eerie environment, but like, you know, something's coming, right? And you don't always see it because of the fog that's or the smoke really in the city. And um, 
Yeah. So I think going to school, there's a lot more puzzle environments that are there. Uh, that kind of gets you started with that. So uh, there's like a piano you have to open up and then there's like certain things you have to find, like that sort of locker comes into place where that cat pops out and little things like that. Um, I, there's like a moon shape, if I recall, and like a sun shape that you have to find in this game and it unlocks like additional parts. Um, so it's been a long time since I played that, but I've played it enough and I've played enough Silent Hill games as well to say that at its current price point, which is absolutely ridiculous, by the way. Oh, my God. Game. Yeah, <laughs> this desperately needs a remake at this price point. Like I am one to talk to that um, complete in box. You're looking at two oh three twenty nine right now, and it is peaked right now. And I think obviously because of the new announcement um, and they're not being a remake for one. And it's trending upwards, which is ridiculous. I think when I got this game, it was like thirty dollars um, at the time. And that, even that was kind of pricey. Uh, a loose copy right now runs you 90 and that peaked in 2021 of May at 104.13 and that price is holding. Uh, so if you really want to pay the money for this game, your best bet's going to go loose. Um, you're going to be paying less than half. There's no digital console version. Yeah, uh, according I, to this. I tried to look. I couldn't find it on PlayStation Plus or... And it's not on the Classic, right? It's not on the Classic because I had yeah. to download it and uh, it's not available. There's no PC port for the first one. There is for Silent Hill 2 and on. Yeah. But like from what we, what I can tell from what I looked up, I, it doesn't look like there's any other way to do this. There might be a Silent Hill collection. Is there? There is, but it doesn't have number one. Okay. That's why this is so much because they put it out on PS3, but it was number two and three that were on there. So, you know, from a cost standpoint, I would never pay two of three for this game. Now, it's a great game. Like in what I have experienced with it in the past and now, I've always had an itch to go back and play this game. Always. It's never been a title where I'm like, oh, I'm just never going to play this again because it's not very good. It's actually even like it holds today. Like I played it on a 4K TV on a PS3, you know, PS3 has a little bit of upscaling. I played it on a 4K TV and it still looked good to me. And I would still absolutely go through and play this game. Um, in fact, maybe that's my inflation deflation for next year is to play Silent Hill uh, because it is a game I've always wanted to beat. And I've always wanted to go back to it and I just never did. Um so I, I would say, of course, you kind of have to go based off the fact that, yes, this is highly inflated on this price point at 203. Yeah. Is it worth 60 bucks? Like if they, you know, for example, released this game today and said it's a retro horror game on like the Switch. Yeah. Like somebody would pay 60 bucks or 40 bucks all day long. Um, but in today's current used price point, no way. Like this is just highly inflated. I, I don't think even at 60, it would be worth it. I, I, I mean, think a, that a new like, Silent Hill is going to run you 60, 70 bucks today. Anyway, well, yeah, a new one, but not yeah. this one. But back then you would have paid 50 back then. Well, yeah, but we're new. not talking about that. I'm talking about now. Saying. Like now, I still think that like 60 bucks is like probably more than I would pay for the first Silent Hill game. Like it's only this expensive because there's no other way to play it. Like if there were more copies of the original, I'm sure it probably would still be like an expensive game, but not this expensive. I just think that, you know, there's a reason they probably aren't remaking this first one. And, um, you know, I would try this game probably some more, but it's definitely got like a legacy and everything to it. Uh, going back, the controls were a little weird being tank controls and that's hard to get used to. Like the graphics are really muddy, but they did a beautiful job doing what they could with the console at the time. Uh, it's got voice work in it. Um, you know, it's definitely iconic for a lot of stuff and I'm sure that I would need to play the whole game to really pass judgment on it. But I just don't think that this is one of those ones that <laughs> is is going to be worth it until it's just like available for like, you know, PlayStation plus or something in the classic library. Like it wasn't even on the PlayStation classic. Like if it was on there, then it would be like, Oh, Hey, 20 bucks. Easy. Go do that. But like, unless this was like on a service, I don't think it's really one to go back to 
for that kind of money. You could probably get as good of an experience going back to like two or something. So um, just a little history on this game, which is pretty cool, is Silent Hill, um, the first one, utilized real-time 3D environments. And so to mitigate limitations, and this is from Wikipedia, the limit, the to mitigate limitations on the hardware, they deliberately use fog and darkness to muddle the graphics. Yeah. It's pretty cool when you think about like what they were able to do to just make it like a seamless and very fluid experience for a game. Yeah, just it's the same the like trickery. they got the fog on like a lot of the N64 games and stuff. Yeah. So um, let's see. I'm just kind of browsing through the wiki here, see if there's anything uh, in particular that we might like. Um, I think we're good. Uh, there's a lot of Silent Hill games out there. So yeah, there certainly are. Yeah, this one is actually one of the higher rated games as well. Like, so number one, number two are higher rated. Uh, and Silent then, Hill two is pretty up there in price too. So that's like yeah, eighty one loose and one hundred and thirty five complete in box. These are just expensive games. Yeah, one, two, and three are all fairly expensive, but they're also uh, the highest rated out of all of them. And then it starts Silent, to kind of go downhill from there. Wait. Silent Hill Collection. Why is it only showing the collection for the PAL PS2? I don't know, but it's on I ha, it's on the PlayStation 3. Mm. The collection. HD collection of sorts. All right, cool. Well, we're both inflated on this one. Inflated. Um, but definitely a good game. So if you have it, it's worth playing it. Um, there are some jump scares later on. I still get goosebumps, even though the graphics are absolute like in comparison to today's graphics garbage but still holds up very well the musical scores are great the atmosphere is great the fluidity of gameplay is great the controls can be wonky but you get used to it and um you know just all the visual elements are great like you feel like you're in silent hill i mean you are technically but you really feel like you're in that environment like you get so like engaged with what you're playing that you feel like you're there. I don't know, and man. Their streets are the widest streets I've ever walked down. Hey, that's trying to cross say, that intersection. I'm like, where's the other side of the road? That's the backstory. They don't tell you about like somebody from city council infrastructure was like, dude, this is the worst design I've ever seen for streets. We're just going to burn the whole MFR to the ground. Yeah. And that's what they did. That's how silent Hill occurred. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we'll figure out. I mean, we're going to be going to November. I don't think there's any Turkey Week games, but we'll figure out what we're going to play. Maybe we'll play Rocky and beat up some turkeys. Like, that's what will happen. <laughs> uh, so we'll figure out our next game later on in the week. We'll get back to you on that, people. Uh, again, you can find us on the podcast you're listening to now, your podcast app. You can leave us that five-star review if you're still with us. And uh, this has been episode 207 of the Game of Flavors podcast. My name's John. I'm Ryan. And thanks for listening. <laughs>